Good afternoon and welcome to The Road to Recovery, The Road to Freedom with Mark. And yes, it is afternoon, it's Friday afternoon at the time of doing this. And um, February's rolled past and summer's gone already, just like that. Blink of an eye, really. And uh, she's hellishly hot at the moment, especially up my way in Pahitua. But even here in Marston today, she's a scorchy Owen has been for some time and we're about a week off relief. Things are getting awfully dry in the countryside here now, um, especially noticeable over the Wairapa side. And uh, I just want to you know, remind farmers that you know all the shade you can provide and all the wool you can get off those sheep, the better this time of year because she's, she's mighty, mighty hot and it'll be time to start feeding out very shortly, I think, uh, without any rain. So... You know, it's a beautiful time of year, um, not so nice from, from midday till about five, she's stifling, but other than that, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful time of the year, Autumn, autumn's always my favourite time of the year because the animals are in fantastic condition coming into winter, the fish and the, the pigs and the deer and hunting and fishing during the autumn is probably the best there is, so I always look forward to this time of year, but... Um, of course, you know, there's always the ongoing battle with depression and one of the very frustrating things I found early on in the piece is that you think you're coming right, you know, you seem to be somehow working out of a slump, maybe things have stopped going wrong for a little while at least and then, um, you know, you, you one or two things might be might have gone right you know you might have had an unexpected win or something didn't turn out quite as badly as you thought and there's a bit of relief and you seem to be going up and then for some reason some unknown reason you just go slumping back down and that's the hardest and most frustrating and often the most dangerous time is when you slump back down because you kind of think well is this never going to end? You know, am I never going to get peace? Am I never going to be happy again? Is this going to just keep happening all the time? Every time I go up, I just come smashing back down. And it doesn't seem to be necessarily any reason or any trigger for it. But I always see mental health problems as physical problems or anything else you know there's days when you feel better and there's days when you feel worse and I guess what you've got to learn to do is to roll with the punches and realize that the yeah, okay the happiness won't be forever but nor will the slump you know and the best thing I find is just to calm down for a week or, or two and try and um, distract myself or at least keep myself busy with things. And I find that I get anxious and agitated and extremely um, obsessed with things very easily especially as I'm going down. I find all the bad habits find a way of creeping back in during those times and I've learned to become a little bit more guarded against letting obsessive behaviour take over. You know, it's always looking for... It's like a cold draft looking for cracks in the house. It's, it's always going to creep its way back in, these bad habits here and there that sometimes completely dominate my life and I find that if I indulge them a little bit just to get over the angst and then walk away and do something calmer you know um, like going down the rivers or going for a bike ride I'm surprised I really am at how few people um, ride bicycles in this in this country now I realise that some of the roads are a little bit flat, um, a little bit, a little bit hilly around Wellington and places like that. And um, you know, not all roads are conducive to uh, 
to bicycles, but there are a lot of places that are, a hell of a lot, and it amazes me that more people don't ride bikes, and it also amazes me that people are fascinated by electric bikes kind of like their spaceships or something, you know, the, the look of shock on somebody's face or, or surprise or delight when they see an electric bike and you think, well, hang on, electric cars have been around for a hundred years. It's just, uh, you know, they've taken a while to catch on. And nobody seems to take them for granted at all. They seem to be this tremendous novelty and I realise that they're prohibitively expensive right now but therein lies the problem if you really want a truly green society then you have to encourage people by uh, investing in these sort of things and to me an electric bike at the right time at the right price will be a hell of a good investment because you're not jumping in the car to get down the corner shops a couple of miles down the road. You can wang it on a electric bike and you know, all you're using is electricity. No pollution, hooray, hooray. Yes, they are expensive, but this is where the government needs to come in and drive those prices down. You know, ensure that we have a standard in regards safety, brakes, etc. Because when you're going 30 k's, you need those brakes to work. Especially considering motorists haven't got used to these things yet. And people, when I'm on my electric bike, people pull out in front of me all of the time, uh, misjudging my speed and thinking that they could easily get in front of me. And uh, you know, I've had a few times where. I, I've had to hammer the brakes on and, and skid down the road trying not to crash into people who have just wallowed in front of me like they're, you know, like they're sailing the Titanic. Um, really, it's just a matter of, of piss poor drivers in New Zealand. Unfortunately, I would say pretty close to the worst drivers in the world. And, you know, I've driven in Southeast Asia, Africa, Europe, and... Yeah, we're, we're definitely some of the very, very worst, um, unfortunately. And again, very simple solution. Everyone who gets a licence, you know, they've got to train under a driving instructor and then the road toll would half overnight. That would save 250 lives a year. Is that not worth it? I think maybe yes, and considering that's just lives. It's not counting all the crippling, the arm breaking, the head smashing, the back snapping, the millions and millions and millions that we have to pay in compensation, the grave sites, the broken families, and yet we choose to continue to let it happen by doing nothing. And this, this affects mental health, of course it does. It affects everybody, you know, Dying on the roads affects a lot of people. Dying because of suicide affects even more. And doing healthy things that are good for your mind, like getting out on a bike, is a positive thing that, at the very least, will save a lot of people a lot of pain, but possibly even save lives. And, you know, that's what it's all about. Now, people might think, well, how the hell did you manage to get hold of an electric bike on a, uh, on a benefit? Well, my mum and dad died, you know, and they left me a bit of money. My sisters decided that in their generosity they would get me this thing. So it's not exactly as if I stole it or I went and did something dubious to find the cash. It fell into my lap somewhat. I have to live without two people I love, but, uh, you know, there are some small compensations for that. So I'm very grateful for what I do have and... Um, you know, living through death, watching people suffer and slowly go out can bring depression on very late in people's lives and because they're not prepared for it and not used to it and it's something that in the past we've always hidden away, it's very hard for people to know what to do because society has kind of stigmatised mental health. Madness is some kind of weakness or it's wrong or there's some dirty connotation to it whereas it's something people go through just like hunger or hunger or sleep or anything else this is part of life some people 
virtually all people will suffer from depression at some point. Some get it worse than others. Just like some people are more susceptible to diseases than others, and it is a lottery. But learning how to deal with your situation and not being too hard on yourself, not beating up on yourself, has a lot to do with getting better. That's one good step, is to realise also that there's going to be highs and lows and expect them. Forewarned, after all, is forearmed. So you have an opportunity to look ahead, know, and prepare ahead of time. And when you start getting depressed, see those signs. You'll feel those warning signs. You'll feel that tightness in your heart. You'll feel physically tired. You'll feel a lack of enthusiasm. Your mind will feel all foggy. And that's the warning bells that you're starting to slump. And that's the time to try and take your mind off things and concentrate on something that's going to bring you a little bit of happiness. And that way you can just go sometimes just into a shallow slump for a few days and then you come right again. Other times, like what's happened with me recently, I go for a slump for a month or maybe two and then I'll come back out once a few things start rolling right for me again. But I find... If one thing after another after another goes wrong, they seem to domino into each other, and that can really spiral you out. So, you know, learning to handle the things that go wrong to mitigate the loss, the damage, the destruction, the hurt, try and lessen that as much as you can so that when you do crash, you don't, go so far down and you don't hit so hard and you're trying to give yourself a softer landing and just look after yourself I find that I suffer from seasonal disorder as well so I get particularly depressed in winter when it's really cold and I feel everything closing in on me and I feel like I'm locked in one room and I've got cabin fever and I don't want to go out and a good way to kick back out of that is do the, exactly the opposite of what you're doing, and that is to walk out in the wind and the rain. As long as you can get enough decent food in you and keep warm and get a decent raincoat, you know, it can be nice just to just to get out of the room, you know. A month locked in a room does anybody's head in, and it's the sort of thing where you've just got to get out and breathe and, you know, I find shopping extremely tedious at the best of times. And when someone says, have a nice day, I just, shit, oh dear, that makes me angry. You know, disingenuous, insincere people that talk to you like that, frankly, it's just insulting. So anyone who does that, please stop doing it. You know, if you're genuinely interested, nice. You want to be pleasant? say hello but don't ask disingenuous questions that you have no desire to hear the answer to because all you want to hear is okay and I might say something to you like how am I doing not particularly well are you really interested as to why or are you just asking me the stupid question because you've got nothing better to think of okay so please don't don't be frivolous don't don't be off-handed with people you know, when I talk to people, they're surprised about how I genuinely engage them. And you can see this initial reaction of shock that I'm not playing the little role that people normally play with them. And it kind of breaks them into consciousness from the somnambulant existence that they've had so far today. And they seem to be genuinely happy to engage. Well, perhaps you folks want to... Think about doing that yourselves a little bit more. Well, time flies, and, um, you know, New Zealand seems to be in a very good situation right now. Unfortunately, um, the whole situation of this pandemic that swept the world has been poorly handled by every single country, and I have not seen one single country that's done a good job 
half a million people are now dead in the United States, which is about a quarter of all deaths, and they probably handled it worse than anyone else. They have a new president now, and he's making the right noises. Vaccines are coming out, and hopefully we'll put this behind us. But I want everyone to remember this, and I want the world to change. And I want the world to change for better. You know, all the way through this, for the last year and a half, we've been talking about kindness. And I want to see a lot more of that. Kindness and consideration and less selfishness. You know, when I see kids dropping their bikes and scooters right in front of a shop door, so everybody else has to step over the top of it. I pick the thing up and throw it into the street because I'm not prepared to put up with obnoxious behaviour like that. The children somehow seem shocked. And I look at them and I say, show a little bit of consideration for other people like they show towards you, all right? And it does hit home, but I think, where the hell is the parenting? They're obviously doing this at home all of the time. And it is this lack of discipline, this lack of considerations, lack of small things. We seem to have been encouraged in the last two or three generations to disregard the law, the commandments, morals, to be greedier, more self-serving. I want a pole shirt bigger than my mate. Greed, 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 greed. You know, it's all about you. It's all about you. Don't miss out. FOMO, the fear of missing out. Is that what we've become? Is that what we've become? Greedy and fearful? Or is that what we always were and we were just pretending otherwise? Unfortunately, I see the worst coming out in people. And I've seen this going on for quite some period of time now. And it's, it's really driven by retailers and the media but wait there's more don't answer now and all night all night long as the trucks are hammering down the road and i can't get sleep all i can get is infomercials on free to wear tv now that's wrong you know the trouble with people suffering from mental health issues like depression is that they're bored. There's not a lot to do. And not everybody's into crusty old books down at the library, and most of them are garbage anyway, as are the videos, about 90 to 95%, and in some cases 99%, are just complete rubbish. They belong in the toilet more than anywhere else. Um, the really good books, well, you don't know what they are, you know. Who in their lifetime would have read Camus or or Colette, let alone Hemingway? You know, it's not the sort of stuff that people really get into. I'm rereading George Orwell's Animal Farm at the moment, and it's interesting to read of of those fears of dystopia of things like Big Brother, 1984 which Orwell also wrote. And funnily enough, 1984, the world that Orwell feared, this big brother watching us, is happening now. And I think not only can we take from this pandemic the idea that we need to be more thoughtful and kinder towards each other, we also need to think about our personal freedoms and how important freedom is to us because... Freedom is key to the pursuit of happiness. And that, after all, is where we're trying to get to. So personal freedoms, you know, people were worried about these um, inoculations being used to put microchips into people's bloodstreams so that the government could keep an eye on you. All these nonsense conspiracy theories. And you think, you know... What kind of idiot would believe anything like that? It's so outrageously far-fetched, you know, that commercial flights are, are, are gassing people with toxins from their exhausts so that um, 
pharmaceutical companies can make more money selling you the cures for the diseases that the government's given you. I heard a woman ring up on the radio station say that she had a university degree and try and push this theory that we're being poisoned by the planes on purpose. And I thought, oh, Lord, that was money wasted on your education, my dear. You know, if something sounds ridiculous and outrageous, it's very probably because it is. And, um, you know, we have voluntarily taken up all of these uh, Bluetooth tracking and COVID screening there's GPSs on our phones. There are, there's a microphone in there that actually listens to what you're saying. And if you don't think so, I've talked to many people who've been sitting there talking to someone or watching the TV and all of a sudden the phone answers a question that wasn't asked of it. Now, it doesn't happen by accident. It's not, it's not a glitch. It's not a ghost in the machine. It's what they're designed to do. And unfortunately... Um, they're just a little bit too intrusive in our lives and we have to guard very, very, very carefully about letting technology into our lives too far and the unfortunate thing about them is that they're extremely addictive to the point where kids feel like they can't live without them and there's not a lot we can do about it now, but I'd say over time we want to be looking at getting our kids back on bicycles, back out tramping and fishing and learning about this magnificent country around them instead of living as if they are, you know, in some kind of metropolis where the, there is no sea, there is no bush, there is no forest, so... I would encourage parents to start with telling your kids, look, let's go to the beach and just leave your phone behind for a few hours. You can catch up when it's back. And weaning them off gently a bit of the time will encourage them to do things and get into the habit of leaving a phone behind and realising that they don't have to have that thing attached to them 24 hours a day that they can walk away at times and have peace time and you want to reinforce those positive words like peace when you're talking to them about things like this. Okay, well, that's me for another day. <coughs> it's time to wrap up. Time to battle on through the end of the summer and try and think as many positive thoughts as I can about the next few months and get out and catch some snaps and... A few tour tours, cook up some good feeds down on the beach with my best mates. That's the sort of things that I live for and look for and those are the sort of things that really lift my spirits. And they don't have to cost a lot of money, you know, it's not that hard to catch a fish if you get into it. You know, a hand line, some nylon, a hook and sinker, a bit of bait. And a bit of burley is a good one too, you know, feed up the water, that's a good trick to get the old fish coming around. I'll tell you what, it's a mighty exciting thing to catch a fish, to cook it yourself, to feel that self-sufficiency, sitting there having a beer and a bit of fish on the fire by the beach with your mates is an awfully hard thing to beat. And, you know, it's important, I, I think, that we in New Zealand think about all of the great things that we do have, the fact that we're safe and well and we can have some good times together and it's important that we support each other as much as possible over this next year. People are going to get tired. People are going to give up on the whole face mask idea. We need to push this right through to the end until the world has sorted their problems out as we've sorted ours out. So until next week, I want to say thank you very much to my friends up in the Wire Wrapper. I know you'll be melting up there right now, so... Take it easy and watch out for fires, please. You know, keep an eye out. Idiots are going to start lighting fires, so you've got to stay on top of that. Keep your eyes peeled. Ring the authorities as quick as you can. And you good folks in the wire wrapper, it's good to be around you, and you good folks. It's a nice community to live in. This, 
the whole of the Wairarapa and over the Manawatu, you know, it's it's an amazing part of the country. It's so beautiful, it's it's breathtaking at times and I love to watch the trout in the rivers and and find a bit of peace and quiet up in the countryside living that bucolic life. Right, that's me for another day. Thank you to all the sponsors of Wairarapa TV. Thank you especially to Michael and Veronica for allowing me to do this show. It's it's been an honour, it's been a privilege for a long, long time now and it's really great to have your support, the support of Arrow Radio, which of course is a not-for-profit organisation, a community radio. So, you know, they're not interested in making dollars and trotting out the same old bang-bang rock and roll stairway to heaven that you've heard a million times before. You know, we're all about people, you know, by people and for people, for our community and we're not trying to make any money out of this, we're simply trying to help people. And at the end of the day, that's what it's, it's what community is, people helping people. Without that, there is no community. So, you know, Michael and Veronica have been rocks of the Wire Rapper and wider community for a long period of time. Arrow Radio is a, a phenomenally good radio station. It's only tiny, but boy, does it box above its weight. Always got interesting music and people from all kinds of walks of life, some fascinating stuff on this radio station. So it really is a privilege to be part of it. So I look forward to seeing you. Well, not really seeing you, for you hearing me and seeing me next week. And uh, until then, take care, look after each other. You know, most importantly, look after yourself. Stay safe, stay healthy. And look after the stuff between your ears because if you do, it'll look after you too. Be good to each other. I'll see you next week.